so what, I, what I've been asked to do is to, is to talk a little bit about creating or church plants that are missional from the beginning. And so that's what we're going to talk about. And there are three things. Like I said, I have way too many slides here. Um, so we'll skip through them. And that's one reason to give you the sheet so that you've got some of the slides that we won't really spend a lot of time on. Okay. Um, but, but there are three things that I want to talk about. One is, is just uh, instilling a missional imagination in a new church plant. Uh, the second is, is learning to discover the community that you live in and how to really connect with that community. And the third piece is then creating structures which are really empowering the mission. And, and let me give you a little bit of, of uh, explanation about those three things. The, the missional imagination piece is critical because for many of us, we came out of churches that were not thinking about being outward directed. We were, we were mainly thinking about ourselves and about doing the things that we wanted to do for ourselves and for our children and our families and stuff, but we weren't really thinking about being on mission with God. And so what, we're, what needs to happen in a new church is to understand that right from the beginning, that we are on this mission with God. And so I'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Uh, the, the second piece, discovering our community. Again, if we're on mission in a community, God wants to change things. God's, God wants to be present in our communities, and, and He wants us to be the agents of that. And so somehow we've got to be able to build bridges with our, with our communities and, and to figure out a way to do that. So we need to talk about that. And that will go to the kind of thing that you were saying just a minute ago. It's so important to you. And then the third piece is just creating the kinds of structures that are going to empower mission. Often in the church, we have structures in place, and those structures have been there for a long time, and so we just perpetuate them. But are they really furthering our mission? Or do we need to kind of re-envision what those structures are and how they need to work? So those are the three pieces that I think are going to be helpful in creating a missional uh, church and a missional DNA. So, First thing is, the, the whole thing about imagination, I think, is that uh, one of the things that, that church planters get to do, and I think it's the most fun part of the job, really, is creating a whole new culture. And, and that means that, that you are helping people to develop a whole new way of living and, and a whole new way of being the church. So often, you know, I grew up talking about going to church. We have home movies of me and my four brothers coming down the stairs and outside in our little, you know, jackets and our ties and, you know, we're, we're all going off to church, you know, and so, so we always talked about that, that we would go to church. The idea that we were the church and we were the church wherever we went was kind of foreign to us growing up. Okay, so what, what I want us to do is to think about it from that perspective and to say, okay, what is it that it means to be the church, to be, in our case, an Anglican church in the 21st century? What does that look like? And how is that different maybe than from what we did growing up and what we we're used to? Okay, uh, one of the things that William Romanowski says is that developing culture means that we, that we are collecting ideals, beliefs, values and assumptions that kind of make up a, a master plan for living and for interpreting life. And I think whether we realize it or not, that's already happened for all of us in one way or another. And, and my guess is that the farther along we are on the road of discipleship, the more tension we feel between the values and assumptions of the culture of the kingdom of God and the values and assumptions of the culture of the world that we live in. There's, there's a way in which some of those values and assumptions are similar and other ways in which they're very much opposed to one another. Uh, we talk a lot about catechesis in the church. I think catechesis is going on all the time in our culture. And it's happening through, our, through the media, through movies, through things that we're reading. There's a, and, and really what's fa fascinating about us, we live in a very interesting time right now because, because what we're seeing is, is people who are v being very intentional about changing the culture that we live in. And not just changing the culture in North America, 
but our government is very intentional by trying to change the culture of other people in other places and other parts of the world. And so we've got this whole thing going on in our world right now that's a fascinating study about what creates culture and how it happens. And so I want to start with the thought that as church planters, that's one of the things that we get to do is to really create culture. And, and I would say it's a kingdom culture, okay? But what, what that means is that, you know, we've got to think about things like practices, convictions, institutions, and narratives that order and give shape to the life of our church plant. Okay, so what you're doing as a, as a cultural architect, if you will, is you're creating a narrative with this group of people, okay? And so you're having to think through everything that you do and how you do it. And one of the things that's so critical about that is to do that in such a way that newcomers that come into that culture feel welcome and feel at home and feel like, hey, I like this. I like being here. I like being a part of this. And what's more than that, I, I, I remember specific times when people have looked at me, and this one lady looked at me, and she said, I don't know what you people have, but whatever it is, I want it. You know, and that's, that was, that's what needs to happen for us, is that, is that we need to really embody the kingdom of God within this culture, and we need to live in such a way that things are different for us. People may not know why they're different, but there's an attraction for them. There's something that says, I want that. Whatever it is, I want to be a part of it. So um, there are some pieces of this, there are some environments. Gerald Woodward, I've got, a, I've got his book up here, Creating a Missional Culture, really a very helpful resource, I think. Uh, he talks about creating five environments. And, and uh, some of these will be familiar to us. Learning, uh, living in the word. As, as Anglicans, we have a high value on that and on the word of God and the authority of scripture. But the thing that he's talking about that I think is really, it puts it in the right mindset, is he talks about praxis. He talks about not just learning, but living it, okay? So what we're doing actually is that we're learning to live out the things that we learn. And I don't know about you, but I did not grow up that way. I grew up learning about stuff. I knew all about evangelism, but I wasn't evangelizing. Okay? I knew all about the story of Christianity, but I wasn't living the story. You know, it wasn't my story. And so one of the things that I think that he's talking about here is learning in such a way that we're actually living it out. Um, he talks about other environments like healing, welcoming, liberating, thriving. Those are, those are very immensely important, especially the liberating piece, because uh, one of the things that, that we're going to run up against, and I see it all the time in Northern Virginia where I live, is that, is that there, there is a need to be released from the culture that we live in. And, and people don't realize even that they're captive to it. And yet, it's in a new setting that you can make that possible for people and make healing and liberation a part of what you're doing. Now, I'm going to go really, really quickly through the, the, the solid foundation. There are two pieces to it, and we could literally spend the rest of our time just on these two pieces. But they are the biblical foundation and the theological foundation. And so what I want to do is just to kind of focus for a minute on, I'm going to skip ahead to the theological framework because of our time frame. I discovered in the last session that we spent so much time on it, but it's important, it really is. And I think as, especially as Anglicans, we have an appreciation for taking the things that we have in the scriptures and being able to apply them in very specific ways, okay? So the four things I wanna talk about theologically that are important, and we see the roots of this in the scripture, that's the part I'm gonna skip over, and it's in your notes. The first one is that, um, is the idea of missio dei, the mission of God, and that, that is that God is on a mission in the world, and God was not content for his creation to be lost, and so, so his whole thrust has been to reclaim us, and to liberate us, and to set us free, and to give us his life. And so God is constantly on mission. And when you think about the, the, the fact that the very nature of God mission emanates from him, 
you think that, okay, within the Trinity, the Father sent the Son to redeem the world. The Son sent the Holy Spirit to empower the church. And the Holy Spirit sends us, the church. We are being sent on mission. And so as we think about the mission of God, we've got to redefine our understanding that what we're about is to be on this mission with God. We've got to be doing what it is that God wants us to be doing. Um, so God is, is constantly on a mission. And one of the things that happens a lot of times is we talk about the church having a mission. But Moltmann says, and, and Halter paraphrases this, that no, the church doesn't have a mission, really. It's God who has the mission. And because God has the mission, God has a church to carry it out. So our mission is to go where God sends us and to do the, what God asks us to do. So one of the questions that we've got to be asking ourselves in terms of assessing, you know, whether it's a new church plant or an established congregation, how are we doing with that? Do, can we identify what mission God has us on? Do we know who he's sending us to? Do, do we know what he's asking us to be about? I, I ask this question, I work with churches all over the country, and I always ask them, what's your mission? What does God have you doing? And it's, it was surprising to me at first. Now, I'm not as surprised. A lot of churches cannot really talk about that. And I'm not just talking about giving me a mission statement, although that's helpful. But I'm talking about the larger, real sense of, what is God doing here? What's God doing in this community and how are we a part of what he's doing? Okay? So to be able to be aware of that, to be able to articulate that, and to be able to, to shape our ministry to carry out that mission is what we're talking about here. So becoming missional, if you're an established congregation or established church plant, you have to be realizing how it is that you're being sent to serve. You know, we're not just doing this I hear this phrase a lot. People say, well, I want to establish an Anglican presence. That's not a mission. I understand that, and I think that's a wonderful thing, but it's not a mission, okay? What God's trying to do is something much deeper than that. And so, so as, as congregations, our whole, uh, our whole focus has to be on, on patterning and shaping the culture of this church around the mission, okay? It's got to be the core reason for our existence, and everything that we do has to be shaped by it. Um, one of the things that's fascinating to me, especially in a new church plant, church plants often try to do too much in the first year. You know, you, you way, church planters way overestimate what they're capable of in, in one year. And, and yet, what they're trying to do is to get all these essential ministries up and running. And one of the things that, that I think is really helpful is to say, wait a minute, what are we defining as essential ministries here? If you let the mission define that, then that number is much less. And you're focusing on accomplishing that mission. And you're not, you know, and, and there are a lot of ministries that are wonderful, and I'm not trying to say that they're, that they're unnecessary or anything like that. But what I'm saying is that you can be doing ministries and investing your time and your resources in those ministries, and they may not be very well connected to your actual mission. So if you let the mission shape those things, then what's going to happen is that you will, you will be much more in alignment with everything that you do. The second piece of this is, is to think incarnationally and to think about the fact that, that you know, Missio Dei is God's purpose, but the incarnation is God's method. And what I mean by that is that just as Jesus had to take on flesh, and he was, a, he was a man, he was a Jewish man, he spoke Aramaic, he lived in the Middle East, we too all have defining characteristics in which, ways in which we are incarnating the good news. Okay? So what, how are we doing that? How are we incarnating the good news? How are we the hands and the feet of Jesus in our community. So again, going back to Halter, he says that being incarnational is not so much about our direction, it's more about how we go, about what we do as we go, about how we are postured in the culture God calls us to engage. I love that word. I, I really think that um, engagement is critical in mission. You know, we, we've got we've to figure out 
how do we engage the people in our community? And, and one of the questions that, that I think is really helpful for us to ask is that if we were not here, if we closed up shop today and we were no longer here, would anybody miss us? Okay? Is, is our presence being felt? Okay? And so what, what I think incarnation does, and incarnational theology says, okay, it's the Holy Spirit working through us. You know, we've got to have that understanding. And so, you know, Michelle was saying at the beginning, she wasn't sure why God wanted her to be here in this workshop. I'm thinking, great, I just love that mindset, that she's asking God where he wants her to be, what he wants her to be doing. That's what we're talking about. Okay, there's a reason. Maybe your only reason is to be here interceding for me so that I don't make a mess of this workshop. I don't know. But the fact is that, you know, God has reasons for us to be where he wants us to be. And the only way we're going to know that is to be in touch with him. Uh, the third piece of the theological framework then is to recognize that God is in the process of bringing his kingdom into being. And he's going to be using us to do that. Now, let me, let me clarify that it's not up to us to bring in the kingdom. We cannot bring in the kingdom. God brings in the kingdom through us in the extent to which we can partner with him and say yes to him and be a part of that process, then to that extent we are going to be experiencing what it means to incarnate the kingdom and to bring people into it. But it's something God is doing. That's God's mission, okay? And when God's kingdom is established in a community, things change. Things are different. Okay? Sometimes that's in little ways, sometimes it's in dramatic ways. But the fact is that things are not going to be the same because God's presence is going to be palpable through the church. Hunsberger says that the church is just a sign, it's a foretaste of the kingdom. It's not synonymous with it. And I think that's a very helpful distinction because that's too great of a burden to think it all depends on us. It doesn't. It doesn't. But we do have a part to play. And so part of what we've got to do is to figure out what is that. Now going back to Woodward, he says, he calls us cultural architects. And I just love that phrase. He says that we have the unique opportunity as church planters to call together a new community that reflects the reign of God in the way we live and pray and worship and serve. And the healing and the transformation that flows through the discipleship process brings lasting change, not only for us, but for all those whose lives intersect with us. Okay? So, I think if we can think about it in that sense, how are we connecting with our community? How is God bringing in the kingdom through us? That's critical. And then the fourth piece of the theological framework is the fact that, that God is always, always, always about raising up leaders. You know, you all would not be here, you would not be at this conference, except somewhere along the line you recognize the call of God to exercise leadership in the body of Christ. That's why you're here. You know, some of us wear a collar, some of us don't, doesn't matter. Leadership is leadership. And, and so what we've got to do is to say, how do we lead by the inspiration and the power of the Holy Spirit? Okay, so, so in creating this whole culture of, of a new church plant or, or even an established church, what, one of the things we've got to be thinking about is how do we establish these patterns in such a way that we're always raising up leaders. We're always helping people to recognize the gifts of the Holy Spirit that, that God has given to each one and how do we activate those gifts. I can tell you as a church planter, one of the real temptations that you have is, is you just kind of, the first thing you want to do is to say, do you have a pulse? Great, I need you over here, you know? And, and so because you're, you're trying to do stuff and you need people to help do, to do this ministry or that ministry or whatever it is. And so we don't think in terms of that person, what God's doing in their life. We just think about our thing and what we're doing. The thing about leadership, if we recognize that we, everybody that God brings to us, that, that God is trying to activate spiritual gifts through them, and, and trying to raise up, up into a place of leadership, then what we're going to do is to say, okay, what are, the, what are the core gifts that that person has? And let's make sure that that person is operating in their passion and in their gifting. I had a gal who was, um, she was a sixth grade English teacher. And um, she was really into music. And somehow, 
somehow we started a drama ministry at our church and so so she got roped into this because of her interest in the music and she found that she loved it and and after a while she was coming up with skits and writing stuff and and it was just amazing to watch her and I went to her at one point and I said I think God wants you to be in charge of this ministry. It's, oh, no, no, no. I, oh, no, I could not do that. I just, I couldn't do that. So, well, why not? So, well, I just, I've never done anything like that. And I said, but you're doing a fabulous job. Do you realize what a great job you're doing here? And so, after some conversation, I convinced her, just give it a try, just, just to see. And, and the whole ministry just blossomed. And, and she was operating in her gifting. And, and her leadership just emerged. So much so that she decided at the end of that school year to stop teaching middle school English and to take a job teaching drama, being the drama teacher at a high school, which she's still doing today. So it's really fascinating because God's at work in our lives and he's doing things through us, but we're not puppets, okay? He's, we're in this partnership with him and he's giving us gifts and he wants us to be in that place where we're passionate. I'm a church planter because I love it. I mean, I love it, and I would do this whether I got paid or not. It's, it, that's the way I feel about the ministry. And I just want everything I do to have to do with starting new church communities and, and to empower church planters. That's my passion, and that's what I love doing. Somehow, I believe that God is, not, that, I, that was not just a one-off experience with me. I believe that God wants to do that with all of us, every single one of us. And so, spirit-filled leadership is all about that and so part of what we've got to be able to do is to be on the lookout for our leaders and to draw them in to these places okay um, let's talk about learning to think and act missionally this is not easy um, if we've not you know my hope and my prayer is that within the ACNA we will develop such a missional culture and it will be such the norm for us that learning to think and act missionally would just be automatic. That's not, I think, where we've been. At least that's not where I was for a long time and I think that's been true for a lot of us. And so we're on this road to becoming missional. Okay, we're somewhere on this journey and we're having to learn to think and act differently. And there are four pieces, uh, Barnes and, and Branson, uh, here we go. Um, Branson and Warren, sorry. Uh, starting missional churches give some really good tips on this and they establish four priorities that they think are important and I agree with them so I want to share them with you. Uh, one is just discerning God's initiatives. Uh, God is at work. That's the whole premise in, in uh, missional theology. That God is already at work He's already doing stuff. He's been doing stuff long before we got here. What's he doing? How are we discerning that? How do we get on board with that? You know, for a lot of us, we, we identify church as being a certain set of activities that we do, whether that's, you know, worship or prayer or Bible study or whatever. God's at work at a much deeper level. Those, those are all expressions of what God's doing. But we make the mistake if we think that we have to have these ministries in place. Are we discerning the deeper purposes of God or not? Because once we discern the deeper purposes, that will define how we do worship and it will define how we do Bible study and so forth. So one of the things that we have to do is to learn to understand and to, and to um, discern what God is about. Uh, another thing they talk about is the neighbor as subject. I think this is an important piece because it would be easy for us. I think, I think uh, becoming missional means very much being in a servant mode and discerning what the needs are. And we're going to talk about that more in just a couple of minutes. But my sense about it is that you can serve in such a way that empowers people or you can serve in such a way that does not empower them. And, and, you know, we, we hear a lot about it at, at this conference. We hear about ways to do things that will really lift up and empower the people we're working with. That's what they mean by the neighbor as subject, where, where they are involved in the process with us. They're not just passive recipients. That would be neighbor as object. Okay? Uh, boundary crossing is another thing, and, and this, I think, is very important because 
in all of our communities. This is not just true of, of uh, planting in the mission field overseas. We've heard lots of stories so far at this conference about that. This is true in our own communities. I know this is true in Northern Virginia, but I think this is true across the, across the board. Our communities are a, a whole different world and we're having to cross over some of those boundaries. There are ways in which people in our communities are going to share the values of the kingdom and ways in which they will not. And so we're going to have to cross over those boundaries and we're going to have to be intentional about it. And part of that intentionality means understanding that we have got to build bridges. We've got to be moving out. We can't just kind of do our own thing and, and allow that to be sufficient for us. Okay. And then the last piece that they talk about is plural leadership, team leadership. Team-based ministry, I think, is critical in church planting. And, and I think that, uh, you know, you're always going to have a charismatic leader. And that charismatic leader is wonderful. You know, the Rick Warrens of the world, or the Bill Hybels of the world, or the Lon Solomons, or whomever it is. Those are wonderful, wonderful godly men, and they're doing a great job. But the reason for their success is because they didn't just rely on their personal charisma. They built very strong teams. And, and uh, I was just out. I was in California last week. And so I thought, well, I'm in California. I should go see, go see Saddleback. So I showed up and I spent an afternoon at Saddleback. And um, it was amazing to me. I, I, it was the first time I'd ever been there. But just to see all the things that are going on, you know, and everybody understanding their role and their part in meeting people and seeing what they're doing and stuff. Uh, it, was, it was the essence of team-based ministry and plural leadership. So as we think about planting churches, we think about creating a missional DNA, one of the things we've got to realize is that God sends us people. He's given them gifts. How do we get them involved? How do we share leadership? How do we do that in such a way that the whole ministry is built up because of their presence? Everybody has something to give. What is it? I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, best practices. Two things that I think are really critical. Uh, one is vision and letting vision drive the ministry. This ties into what we were just saying about discerning what God's doing. Uh, the, the key question for me in, in Vision is, can we see what God is doing? You know, can we understand what's happening in this community and where God's taking it? Uh, Bert Nannis says that a, a true vision must provide a clear image of the desirable future. You know, what's that snapshot look like? What, what does he want this community to look like in 10 years or in 20 years? Okay, and, and understand that from God's perspective. Okay, and it's got to be a target then that will spur us on. It's got to challenge us and, and be a target that we can work towards and de de devote all of our energies to. My sense about vision, we, don't, we have not talked a lot about vision in the church. Every now and then you hear people talk about, well, our vision statement is thus and such. And I understand that and that's good and I'm glad that there's a vision statement there. But for most people, they'd have to look it up. Our vision statement is, uh, let's see, okay, here it is. You know, somebody worked this out 27 years ago, and here's our vision. I'm talking about a vision that's so compelling that everybody knows it. You know, we are, a, a, we are disciples who make disciples, and we're a church that plants churches. That's our vision. We're gonna, that's what we're going to be doing. Something that says, this is where we're working towards. We're not there yet, but we're working towards it, okay? And it describes what we see happening. And so we understand ourselves as a church. I was talking to a guy last week and, and they started their church as a church plant and I'm going to say it was about 12 or 15 years ago and they started with the idea that they were going to be a church planting church. Now they still don't have their own building. They're still renting space and they're renting an office but they've started about I think 10 or 11 churches okay, in that whole time. And all over the place, not just in the, in the D.C. area, but in other places as well. And, and, you know, it was that vision that drove them forward. It was that vision that, that shaped their budget, you know, where they set money aside. It was that vision that got seminarians to come and work as interns that they could then send out as church planters. That's what vision does. And so what vision uh, does for us is it allows us to see things from God's perspective. Okay? Uh, Jesus said, and, and he all through, Sorry. hey Neil, welcome. Um, all through the scriptures, Jesus is talking 
about the fact that, that he's in this wonderful partnership with the Father and he talks about doing the works that the Father does and, and speaking the words that the Father gives him. And everything he talks about is this wonderful partnership. In John 5, 19, he says, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he does. That's the essence of being missional. Okay? Jesus was on a mission that God had given to him. He was fulfilling that mission. That's what we're about too. We've got to be able to see it. We've got to be able to understand it. And we've got to be able to allow it to shape what we do. Uh, one of the things that I think is helpful in this whole process is to recognize that sometimes circumstances overcome our vision. Okay? Um, Abraham had this experience. Uh, you, you might remember this in Genesis 15 where Abraham is grousing with God about the fact that God promised him an heir and he has no heir. He left Ur. He's in the promised land. He did what God wanted him to do and he has no heir. And he is telling God about it. He is not happy. Okay? And so God just lets him go on and on. And the first thing he does is says, Abraham, go outside. And he brought him outside and he said, look toward heaven and number the stars. Okay. What happened was Abraham's circumstances had overcome the vision. And he was looking at his circumstances. He wasn't looking at the vision. And so he had what I call tent vision. His, his vision was limited by the top of his tent. So God had to get him outside the tent, let him see the vision from his perspective. And say, that's what I see. That's what I see. That's where I'm going and that's where you're going. And remind him of that. Now, he didn't give him a new promise. He just reinforced the promise he had already given him. But he had to get him outside of his circumstances in order to see it. That's why I think vision is so important. Because church planting is not easy work. And so there are going to be plenty of times where your circumstances are going to be telling you one thing, and your experience is going to be telling you one thing, and the vision has got to be telling you something very different. Okay? So, being vision-driven learns to be, uh, means to be uh, dreaming with God and seeing possibilities from where God is. Now, there's another aspect to this that I want to talk about, and, and that is in Proverbs 29, 18. It says, where, where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. Uh, King James says the people perish. Okay? I like this translation a little bit better because I think, I think it gives us a better sense about how people perish. And, and, and what he's talking about here is that, you know, without God's word, then we are, we are abandoned to our own sinful ways. All right? So what happens is that, is that we're all kind of pulling against each other, pulling against God, and, and we wind up fighting one another. Now, the vision helps us to all move together and move in an alignment and to move in alignment with God. And when I was on a mission trip to Uruguay, God gave me a wonderful picture of this. I'm, I'm a very visual person, and so I need pictures for God to get something through to me. And so I was out, um, I was in Montevideo, and most of, the, most of the people in Uruguay live in the capital city of Montevideo. High-rise apartments everywhere. And so this is a very common sight. I was out, I was out uh, for my morning run, and you see all these dog walkers with all these dogs on a leash. And it was just a fascinating sight, you know, and I, I didn't think a whole lot about it until like the third day I was there, I came across an apprentice dog walker. Now, how did I know he was an apprentice dog walker? All his dogs are going everywhere. The dogs are going everywhere, right. The dogs are leading him. He wasn't leading them. And I thought to myself, okay, that, as soon as I saw it, I thought, wow, that, that is an, a perfect picture of why we need vision. Because this is vision, right here. Everybody's moving in the same direction. Everybody's pulling together, okay? I don't know how you become, you go from being an apprentice to being somebody who's an experienced dog walker. I'm not sure how you do that. But I do know that as a church planter, it's very important to, to clarify vision and to be able to help people understand vision and to see how they are a part of it. And when you do that, then everybody's moving together. And we've got plenty of instances in the scriptures where that didn't happen, okay? And, and people were grumbling, they were wanting to, they were wanting to stone Moses or whoever, whomever it was. There were numbers of times where we, we have a good picture of this. 
Uh, vision, Tim Keller talks about it, vision as middleware. And, and I think it's a great distinction because in our sense, we, we have real value around clear doctrine. But one of the mistakes that I see us making is that we go from clear doctrine to ministry strategy. And, and I think what Keller's saying is, no, we need vision in the middle to help to flesh out what ministry strategy look, needs to look like. The, the vision is, a, is an integral component of that. And so it, it's built on sound doctrine, yes, but then it, it shapes the expression of what that looks like. And, and uh, Will Mancini gives it a, a little differently. He talks about the kingdom concept, and he talks about it as the sweet spot in here. He says that vision emerges at the intersection of the needs of the community, the local community, the collective potential of the planting team, and what, what he means by that are your gifts, the talents, the ways that God has, is empowering you to do the things that you're doing, okay? And the apostolic esprit, which is the leadership, and what empowers the leadership, and what is, what is it that's driving them. And where those three things come together, he says, that's where vision begins to emerge. And I'm not going to talk any more about this, but I, but I like Mancini. I think he does the best job of clarifying. He uses what he calls a vision frame. And, and if, you, if you're thinking about needing to have greater clarity for your church or for your church plant, read Church Unique. He gives some very good tips for how to do that. So that's being vision driven. Okay, that's, that's one of my best practices. Yes, Steve. Go back several slides. You have sure. Doesn't it also answer the question why? It does answer the question why. It does. Now, um, I think that um, there are a lot of different ways to understand what vision accomplishes. But, but I think what it does is it gets us all on the same page in terms of, of what we're trying to accomplish. Now, a mission, people use, oftentimes use the word vision and mission interchangeably. The difference in my mind is that vision is the big picture, whereas mission really talks about how you are going to do that. Okay, so you need the big picture, you need the why, you need to be able even to talk about the what, but mission is the how, and, and that says this is, this is how we are going to try to accomplish this. Okay? Okay. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is prayer. We've heard a lot about that at this conference, and I love that. I love the fact that there's such an emphasis on prayer. Um, as a church planter, uh, I learned how to pray. I thought I knew how to pray before. I didn't. I learned. And uh, what I had to learn was that, you know, E.M. Bounds says this. He says, prayer is not preparation for the battle. Preparation is, I mean, prayer is the battle. And, and, and so what he's saying is that something actually happens in the spiritual realm through prayer. Uh, John Guernsey, who is our dear friend and bishop, does, he's, his workshop is on being a prayer-driven church. Excellent, excellent workshop. And, I, and, and, you know, he taught me this. I was a seminarian at All Saints, you know, 25 years ago, whenever it was. And I learned this from him, and I learned it from All Saints, because learning how to pray really is so, so, so important because that's where you really get in touch with what is it that God wants here? And, and how is that different than what we want? And having to come to grips with that on your knees and, and really to surrender to God's purposes and, and, and to allow God then to empower us to carry out His purposes. Now, in the scriptures, we see, we see two different ways. We see personal prayer and all the great leaders of the Bible got up early in the morning, devoted time to prayer, and that's another thing I love about our tradition, you know, the daily office. I do the daily office every day, and you know, it's just part of, it's shaped me as, as you know, uh, as a Christian, but also as a, as a priest. And I, my, my sense about it is that we've got to be able to teach us in developing the culture of our church plants, we're not going to have a missional culture if we're not a praying church. We've really got to get a sense about what does God want of us. And so that brings us to the second one, which is corporate prayer and learning how to, how to pray together. Again, I learned this from John, and, and it was so helpful to me to, to recognize that I needed to teach my leaders how to hear God together. You know? I mean, hearing God, that's, that's kind of a, that's one of those things that I don't remember growing up learning about. 
You know, people didn't talk about hearing God. And, and if they did, it was sort of in an esoteric way, you know, not in, a, in a, an intensely personal way where God has a plan, God is doing something, and God needs me to be on board with this. And how am I listening? And how am I responding? How am I being obedient? So corporate prayer, we see in the Acts a number of places where the place was shaken, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and, and the result of that was a tremendous boldness. Uh, in Acts 13, they, they were praying, and they heard the Holy Spirit say, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Now, there are plenty of times when I've wanted to set apart somebody in my congregation for the work that I was sure God was calling them to do. But that's a different thing, you know? I mean, there, this, is, this is where God is directing it. That's what we're talking about. And, and so what happens here is it's not our plans. It's, it's God's. And so, you know, we're talking about Paul and Barnabas. You know, we're talking about the leaders of this community. They weren't sending the B team here. This is the A team. This is, this is the, the most, these are the most important leaders. And yet, because they were praying together, they heard God, they fasted, they prayed, they laid hands on them, and they sent them out. Okay? Now, last piece about prayer, and then we'll move on, is the order. When I first started to plant my church in Northern Virginia, Northern Virginia is filled with high-powered type A people. You know, and Washington tends to attract those kind of people. And I had, I had a federal judge, I had people who were entrepreneurs who had built up businesses from their basement into multinational corporations with offices in 19 states. You know, I had all these people. And so we would get together, and the, the pattern that we followed was that we would listen to each other, because everybody had an opinion, so we had to listen to everybody, and then we'd make a decision, and then we'd pray over it, and ask God to bless it, and then we would carry it out. What's wrong with that? Prayer's third on the list. Hello? Yeah, who you're listening to versus the That's right. And I, I, I realized we, the first time as a new church plant we were trying to create a budget, it took us five months to create our first budget. And I was thinking back to my days at All Saints where they would create a budget in like one vestry meeting and I'd say, what's different? And then I realized, okay, the order's wrong. And that's when I, that's when I began to realize, okay, I've got to switch the order. We have to start by praying, you know? And, and I remember, I remember the, the, the All Saints vestry meetings. We would start by praying. We'd gather around the altar. Everybody would pray for an hour before we'd even have the vestry meeting start. It was revolutionary. And so we started to do that. And when we started to do that and prayed first, then the one we were listening to was not everyone else. We were listening to God. And then our decisions were in accordance with God's purpose, what he was doing with us. And then it wasn't uh, the perfunctory prayer of please bless what we want to do. It was no, help us to carry out what you want to do. Very different, very different kind of a process. So in that, that whole thing, in terms of best practices, and we need to be thinking about what happens when we pray. We're really learning to listen to God's heart. We're learning to recognize together God's voice. Uh, we're receiving his vision. We're receiving his direction. We're focused on his battles, not our own, or the ones of our own creation. And we're learning how to move together in the power of the Spirit. I think those, those, in terms of best practices, have to be built into a culture right from the beginning. And when those become a part of the culture of a new church, then that allows that church to really thrive and, and, to, and to, to begin to do the things that God wants them to be doing and in that process really begin uh, to be effective. Okay, any questions about that before we move on to the second segment? Okay, second segment then is discovering our community. And, and this, I think, is really critical, critical piece and, and a piece that we have not really given a lot of thought to. We are, we talked earlier about the incarnational aspect of our ministry and the fact that God is incarnating through us what he wants to do in our community. My experience tells me that, that we've got to know who's living there. What are their needs? How is it that God wants to touch their lives? This is not going to be the same from one community to the next. Every one of us lives in a unique community. Okay? Now there, there are at least three of us here that are from Northern Virginia, so, so we could all kind of define, but even, in, even among the three of us, 
every one of our communities is going to be different and it's going to be unique. And I can, I'm sitting here thinking about the ways that Woodbridge is different than Centerville and Centerville is different than Fairfax, you know? So part of what we've got to do here it is, is, is learn to discover who's out there and what is it that God wants to do for them. And so the first piece of that is learning to ask missional questions. It goes back to the, the theological piece we were talking about. So the, the kinds of questions that I like to ask my leaders are these. What would be good news in our community? Okay? I mean, I mean what really is going to be great news for, for the people that live around us? Right? And how can that good news be lived out? That's the incarnational question. Uh, the reign of God, what would be different if God's reign were actually established here? You know, we've all heard the stories, I'm sure you've heard the stories, jo George Otis and his ministry in and, and, uh, lots of different places. I know in Kentucky, here in this country, in Columbia, different places where radical transformation has occurred when the kingdom of God is established. And I think God allows for those radical ones to be able to, to give us a picture to say, that's what I want to do everywhere. That's what it means to say the kingdom of God is coming in, it's being established. Now for us, we've got to say, what does that mean for my community, for where I'm living? You know, how is that going to be lived out? And then the leadership question is finding out who are already the persons of peace within this community. Okay, so where do we start in terms of, of discovering our community? Um, let me give you a, a five-step process. One of the groups that I work with, I'm a, a mission strategist for a group called Fresh Expressions. Fresh Expressions has been a, a wonderful movement in the United Kingdom where they have really learned how to listen to their communities. And they, they have just got this down to a, a, a science. So one of the things that they, that they share is this five-step listening process. Listening for mission is what they call it. And the first step, is recording your first impressions. There's something very helpful about doing a windshield survey and just driving around your community. I, we've talked a lot about prayer walking. I talk about prayer driving. Just get in your car and start driving around and just notice things and, and ask God to show you stuff. You know, begin to identify the, the patterns that you see. What are the boundaries, whether they're natural or man-made? What types of persons live here? Okay. What kind of changes do you see in one section or another? Okay. What are the churches that are here? What are the agencies? So that's sort of the beginning, just learning to, uh, and learning to record, learning to see. The second piece is research. And, and this is where you become very intentional about the impressions that you just recorded. Okay, so then you go back to the internet, or you go back to the county zoning office, or you go back to the county supervisor's office, and you start talking to people, and you find out about who are the people that live here. First of all, what area are we trying to reach? This is, I think, a very helpful question, and a lot of people are not asking it. Who are we trying to reach? Where are they? Is that telling us something? It's another presentation. Okay, good. I didn't know if we were supposed to, if it was a fire drill or what it was. So. Yeah, shofar. I said a shofar. Okay, good. Pretty sure. Okay. So, uh, some possibilities for research. There are lots and th lots of possibilities on the internet. I like going and seeing what the population is. I like to look at the census data. This really helped me. Actually, we were, at one point, our community changed dramatically in a very short period of time. We planted the church and Within, within the first six or seven years, the whole community, the pattern shifted. And, and, and the census data showed us that it was happening. And it, what it showed us was uh, that the Latino population had increased 500% since the last census, and the Asian population had increased 1,000%. And so we were looking at that and we're saying, wow, what are we doing to reach the Asian and the Latino populations? And the answer at that time was nothing. And so what we did, based upon doing our research, and, and so I'm talking not just about doing this for a new church plan. I think churches ought to do this stuff all the time, okay? And, and we said, okay, what, what does that mean for our, our outreach? If we've got people from these communities, what would they need? And somebody said, well, and we, we're just asking the question. We're just prayerfully saying, Lord, show us. What, what can we do to build bridges in our community? And somebody said, well, what about language? 
Maybe, maybe those folks need language. English is a second language. So we said, great. And we really felt God was saying to us, do this. So it was actually Jenny's husband, Larry. Uh, they were part of our church at that time. And, and so, so Larry is a linguist and, and the guy is, like, speaks all these languages. So he trained us and we would meet, a whole group of us started meeting after church and he was training us as to how to teach English as a second language. And so we had all these people who were staying after church, and there were like 52 people who were learning to be conversation partners. And, and we had no idea if there was anybody out there that even needed this, but we were trying to be intentional about our mission and about our outreach. And so he took us through this whole training process, and we put up a sign in the library saying, free English classes, Monday nights, 7.30. And we showed up the first time, there were 80-some people, 85 people waiting for this class. Bingo. So, you know, in research and listening and prayerful listening is what clued us into that. Okay? So doing demographics is extremely, extremely helpful. Uh, it, it gives you some obvious things that you can identify and, and it helps you to, to really focus your ministry. So five R's, record, research. Third one is uh, um, reconnaissance. And um, the thing about reconnaissance I think is actually just getting out in your community and talking to people. Uh, I, I'm, I'm amazed at how difficult this can be sometimes in our churches. We, we almost are, uh, I don't know, I, what's the word? We're so reticent. And I remember, I remember talking with your dad, John, about this. And he, and he started this whole thing about, about just, he got very intentional about it and saying, okay, I've got to find out who's in my community. And he, that's when he met uh, that guy, I think his name was Chubby, the guy that was the, the tavern keeper. And, and then they got, they got connected with the Flag Day ceremonies and he started got, getting involved in all that kind of stuff. And I think what happens when you, when you go out and you just, what, it, what reconnaissance means is you're doing prayer walking, you're starting to just engage people in conversation. And what I was just referring to with John's dad was he would just go and just get in intentional conversations with people. And he would go and have lunch at different places and just talk people up, chat people up, and, and just get to, get to find out who they are and what's happening here. Okay, and then begin to participate in the community activities. And so this whole thing about Flag Day was real big in the, in the community outside of Toronto where they live. And if I remember correctly, they at some point began to actually head that up, didn't they? Yeah, right until they left their family. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it was things like that about saying, what's important to the people that live here? You know, we're, we're, not, we're not trying to make them feel that that what is important to us should be important to them. No, we're, we're going to say what's important to them and how do we join them there. That's what Jesus did. He came to us. And when we're on mission, we have to go in the same way. Okay? Um, praying for a person of peace. So, so the tavern keeper, Chubby, in this case, was he was the person of peace. He knew everybody. And as I recall, he, he would go on vacation every year and he took all these people with him. That's, that's what I remember. So this is the kind of thing that has to happen. You have to find who is that person of peace that's out there that can open up the social networks for you and get you connected to the rest of the people in the community. The fourth R is reflection. And reflection means just really prayerfully taking all of this stuff into account. What you're doing is you're gathering data. But at some point, you have to take your data to the Lord and you've got to analyze it in God's presence. So quiet days are good. You know, really, really thinking through what you see in the Gospels, what you see in the Scriptures, what happened there, how were they living out what we're talking about, what kind of challenges exist in this community, and how might we, we respond to those challenges. Okay? So reflection is the fourth R. And then the fifth R is refresh, and that is basically having this time with one another to process this stuff and saying, okay, in light of all this stuff, what should we do? What should we do? How can we do this? And, and what is it that's important for us to do? Okay? So that's the, that's the five R's of Fresh Expressions teaches. I think it's great. It's, in my mind, it's, it's a way of exegeting your community and the culture in your community and figuring out who they are and how it is that you can connect with them. And, and one of the, the big pieces about this, I think, are just being able to identify the values, the things that are important to people. 
Because part of our job in connecting with them is to affirm those values that can be affirmed, but to challenge those values that need to be challenged. Keller talks a lot about this in Center Church, and I think it's really important. That's how we contextualize our ministry, is, is that we've got to understand from a values. A values perspective is important because it, it's those foundational beliefs that people have, not, that, not beliefs, but convictions. People are convinced about stuff. Why are they convinced about it? And, and so we've got to be able to, to connect with that somehow with them and, and be able to walk with them and have intentional conversation about it. Um, so, cultural exegesis means identifying points of connection and identifying points of contention. Okay? And what that's going to do is it's going to help us to build contacts, build relationships, begin to form networking strategies, ways that we can, we can connect with one another, and also ways in which uh, we are going to have to challenge the presuppositions of the people in our community and present them some alternatives that will help them in terms of healing and liberation and coming under the reign of God, okay? And all that's gonna, it's gonna help us as, as, a, as a priest, as a preacher, I'm thinking that way all the time when I'm reading the newspaper or I'm watching the news on TV, I'm thinking about values all the time and saying, what values are being presented here, okay? Because those are my preaching points. And, and what, what we have got to be thinking about, if we're building a missional culture, Everybody that comes into us is going to, in some way, have the values of the culture have leached into them. And so part of what's got to happen is we've got to help them to separate that out. Okay? All right. Um, I'm not going to talk about building relational bridges because of our time frame. So I'm going to skip ahead, although that's extremely important. Relational evangelism is what this is all about. And I think that. Um, the culture that we live in is one where, where we have got to earn the right to be heard. Okay? So we can, we can go in thinking that we can proclaim the gospel and definitely we do need to do that. But we have to have a relational bridge to do that with. So, so just a quick graphic. If you've built a, a two-ton bridge relationally, and you have a four-ton message, what's going to happen? It yeah, it, it's going to collapse underneath you. So, so you've got to be really careful in terms of building that relationship and making sure that relationship can sustain the message that you're going to, that you're going to give. Okay? Every bridge you go over, you see what it's rated at. You know? And it shows how many pounds that bridge can handle. And we've got to be thinking that in terms of our relationships as well. Okay, there are a lot of ways to do this in terms of best practices. Um, community events are really helpful, doing things like carnivals, movie nights, uh, family fun nights, uh, felt need seminars like parenting, marriage seminars, stuff like that. There are different ways to do that. Uh, one of the things that, that we've used very successfully a lot in our church plants is just doing block parties. Um, we, we discovered this probably, I don't know how many years ago it was, but we realized that we lived in an area where a lot of people commuted for work and they actually didn't know each other very well. And so the, one of the questions that, that we, were in, in terms of identifying the needs in the community, we we're saying, well, people really don't know one another. How can we help facilitate people just getting to know each other? So we decided to throw a block party. And we just, all we did was just print up little uh, flyers and put them on everybody's door and says, you know, we're having a, a Labor Day block party. We're going to meet in the cul-de-sac, bring something to share, you know, bring your kids. We're going to have activities for the kids and we're going to have, we'll be grilling burgers. So we just took my, my um, propane grill down there and a couple of my neighbors brought their propane and we were down there grilling hot dogs and hamburgers and just having fun and it was such a revelational thing to, to realize that there were people in our neighborhood that had been living there for 10 years who didn't know each other you know because their commute is such and they come home and they go in their house or they do their activities or whatever and you never see them so block parties we thought we found were, were really great ways of discovering our communities there's a, a good Good tool to use, Rapid Community Assessment by David Mills. Excellent resources. Uh, a few things to remember before we get off of this. One is that as the leader, 
if you are leading this new church plant, people are going to follow your lead. You can't really tell them to go do something that you're not willing to do. You need to be going out there doing it as well. Another thing to remember is people need different doors. A lot of, a lot of mistakes that our young churches make is starting public worship too soon because they think as soon as we have a, a, a worship service, we're going to be official and people are going to come. So they start a worship service and people don't come and they're wondering because they haven't done all the other stuff that we've been talking about. People need different doors to come in. They need a front door, like a worship service, but they need the, the side door or the back door too. And those might be any of these other things that we've been talking about. All right. Um, another thing that I, that I want to say to you, my chaplain at seminary, uh, Churchill Gibson, always used to say 90% of life is just showing up. I'm not sure who he ripped that off of, but that's a great saying. I've never forgotten it. And, and it's true. You know, we just got to get out there. We just got to try some of these things. And, and my advice to you is this, just to try stuff, just to get out there. And uh, as one of my church planters says, get your Celtic evangelism on. All right? Celtic evangelism is great. Read George Hunter. It's a great book. He talks about, you know, low resource. You don't need to spend a lot of money. High touch. Taking time. Being with each other. Uh, repeatable. Keep doing stuff over and over so that people begin to see that you care and you're investing and be incarnational. Bring Jesus to others. Okay, we're not talking about be doing big programs. We're talking about doing stuff with people on a regular basis. Okay, so that brings us to the last piece. Any questions about discovering community and, and trying to meet needs in the community? Okay, so the last piece is creating effective structures. Um, one of the things that, that I think is really important is really getting people involved personally. Uh, one of the things that, that we discovered early on is we were a cell-based church. We started with, as a home group, and that uh, then multiplied into a second home group, a third home group. Then from three we went to five, five to seven, and at some point we planted the church once we got enough, enough groups there. Uh, but what we found is that we needed, we, we were plugging everybody into these groups. That was the main, our main way of connecting people to the church. Every group needed to be doing something in the way of outreach and evangelism. And, and, and so it, it was a little different because what most people were used to in small groups was studying. Studying the Bible together. And that's a good thing to do and we didn't want them to stop doing that. But what we were saying was, you know, we have to take what we're learning in the scriptures and putting it into our practice. And so we were asking each, each home group to have something that they did every month, at least once a month, where they're going to, to something in their community and serving and doing it personally. So it, it's not just discipleship in your head. Okay? Um, okay. So team-based ministry, we see this in Jesus' ministry. He appointed 70 others. We had, Jesus had his team of three, his team of 12, his team of 70, his team of 120. You know, he sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. When we talk about creating a missional DNA, we're talking about people understanding that they're going ahead of the Lord. He's sending us, and he's sending us in order to build that bridge that he can come across, okay? So, so people have got to recognize the fact that they, they are going personally for that reason, okay? Um, I love this scripture because one of the things that Jesus is saying in this is, look, I'm sending you. You don't have to take all this stuff that you think you need, you know? Think about the first really big trip you went on and how many suitcases you took. I remember, I remember going on one of these trips with my wife and we had like five suitcases. And I'm thinking, how long are we gonna be there? You know, we took everything but the kitchen sink. And over, over the years that we've been married, we've learned. Now we get it down to one suitcase. You know, you don't need a lot. You don't need a lot to do missional outreach, all right? We, we are used to thinking in different terms. And I think one of the things Jesus was saying here was, look, learn to depend on me, okay? And if you depend on me, I will take care of you. Now, the problem is that most of us don't want to do that because we're so used to depending on me instead of depending on him. 
So this is, you know, when we talk about creating missional structures, we're talking about being lean, we're talking about allowing God to provide, we're talking about not having all this stuff in place, but really allowing God to do the things that only He can do. You know, we do our little piece, and then God takes our little lunch, and He multiplies it. And He can do so much with it if we would just allow Him to act. Okay? But, but the key thing about team-based ministry, I think, is that, you know, we are incarnating the gospel, and we are working together to do this. And, and my sense about it is that if we look at the way Jesus did this, uh, he had a pattern, and I'm sure you've seen this. I can't remember which book I got this out of, but I love it because it's very much uh, a relational model where, where, you know, what he did, what we see him doing in the scriptures is he did it, and he had his disciples watching him and seeing what he was doing. We learn a lot by watching other people. You know, I mentioned that earlier about my time at All Saints and just watching John Guernsey for the two years I was there, I learned so much just by watching him. But, but then I got to a point where it says, okay, now I do you help. So he got me involved helping him to do stuff and there was a mentoring aspect and then we would debrief afterwards the things that I was doing. And then it was my turn. And then you do this and I'll help you. And I remember the first time he wanted me to preach, and I was terrified. I mean, can you imagine having to preach after John Guernsey, you know? It was, it was not a happy time. But, you know, but he would help me with that, you know? And so I would have to, I would have to get up there and, and you know, try to, try to find my own voice. And that's the thing about leadership. That's the thing as we're building ministry teams, is we're having to give people opportunity, and we're giving them permission to find their own voice and find their own expression. You know, every one of us has got to enter into that. We talked about the fact that we all have gifts. God has given gifts to us, but those gifts have to be activated. And in a missional setting, what we're doing for one another is creating an environment that gives permission to everybody to, to allow the, the Lord to activate those gifts. And we help them to do it, but we really and truly have to give it away. And, and the church plants that I see that struggle are the ones where, where they're not doing team-based ministry. It's all kind of, everything's held within the tight control of a church planter who, who wants to make sure it's all done right. Well, hello, we're not gonna, we're gonna mess up. We are gonna mess up. And, and the whole learning process is figuring out why we messed up and how to correct it, okay? And, and we see Jesus doing this all the time and he helped, he, he let them do it. I love when they came down from the Mount of Transfiguration and they're saying, you know, we couldn't cast this demon out and you just came and did it. You know, we have to figure out what we're doing wrong and how to correct it. And so Jesus corrected them and said, okay, this is only going to come out by prayer. So if you want to move into that place, you've got to learn how to pray better. Okay? And I think that's, that's the, the whole motivation then in our spiritual growth. Uh, the next step is you do and I watch. Okay? There's a, there's a real launching at this point. And when we're establishing missional communities and church plants, one of the things that we're doing is we're raising up leaders all the time will, that will eventually launch, okay? And the growth of this church plant or the growth of this missional community depends on those leaders launching, all right? That's got to happen. And we've got we've to help them to do it, and we've got we've to let go. And we monitor them, you know? We, we have to stay close enough so that if they start to... to fall that we can be right there for them, okay? But the fact is that what's got to happen here is that, you know, we are, we are letting them fly and we're just trying to be right there alongside of them, okay? And then the last piece is that then they multiply, that they begin the whole process that you just did with them and they're doing it with other people. Now, I think I'm out of time. Is that right, Kevin? That's probably why he was here. I thought he was here because he really wanted to hear this workshop and he knew that this was the best workshop to be in. But then it dawned on me. I get to listen to it when I have It's right. <laughs> okay. So, um, anyway, the last piece, and I'll just say it real quickly about planning, is that I really believe very strongly in planning. I think that one of the things that happens in the planning process, uh, Mike Breen talks about the learning circle, and I love it. You know, we observe. We reflect, there's, a, there's a, a spiritual reflection that goes on here. We discuss together, and then we plan. We talk about how we're gonna be accountable, and then we act. 
and then we repeat the whole cycle. And if we can get into the process of thinking about planning as a, as a cyclical process that we have to do all the time, then I think what happens is that we're constantly reflecting on what we're doing, how we're doing it, and how successful or effective it is so that we can tweak it. And, and so we're not constantly having to start over again. We're just tweaking what we did, building on the lessons that God teaches us. Okay? There's some other things. You've got some other slides there, but any questions? We're going to go ahead and stop here since our time. Yes, Steve? Yeah, what's the best way to do research on your local community? Mm. What's the best source? Great question. I think the best way to do research in your community is to contact community leaders that are in place. I think the, the best kind of folks to talk to uh, our government people, uh, our, our school principals, and agency workers. Those are the people that I always start with. And I always ask them after, at the end of the conversation, I always take them to lunch or take them to coffee. At the end of it, I say, who else should I talk to? And, and then they give me somebody else to talk to. But they know. They know. And, and you, you really get the feel. And you begin to hear the same things over and over, but from different perspectives. You know, the, the principals are always going to give you the family perspective. You know, they always, they have a, a real beat on that and what, what families are struggling with, okay? Agency workers are more focused on specific problem areas, okay, that are in the community. So if you want to know what the needs are, they're going to help you to get that picture. And then the government officials are, are ones that kind of have the big picture and say what's happening in this community sort of as, as a whole. And, and where is it going and what are the big things that have to happen for it? And the question I always like to ask them is to say, okay, as a new church, if you could ask us to do one thing, what would you want us to do? And, and you begin to ask that question of those leaders and you come away with a picture that's very clear about where the niche is that you can fit into. Okay. Any other thoughts or questions? Okay. Good to be with you. Thank you. <laughs>